Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, TLC Live Song. Yes, Lord. You are the one who raised us up to life, Lord God. You are the one who heals our brokenness. Lord, we thank you for your life. We thank you for your life, God. We bless your name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, family. Welcome to church. And this morning, we're going to continue our series on raising the bar, sex, love, and true satisfaction. And this explores our quest for true satisfaction and love. Now, I will be the one doing this second installment, and Pastor Joan will instead be here next week with a very insightful message, so you don't want to miss that. In fact, if you missed last week, Pastor Dwight shared with us that as humans, we're all made in the image of God, and it's a very powerful message. So if you did miss it, watch it on YouTube, because this sermon series we know has been given to us by God, and it is a wonderful, wonderful and powerful series. Now, when Pastor Dwight was sharing about the fact that we are made in the image of God, he, he shared from Genesis 5 when it says, when God created human beings, he made them to be like himself. He created them male and female, and he blessed them and called them human. God blessed us to be male and female, and that we can enjoy fellowship through relating to each other, but most importantly, to be in relationship with him. Because this reflects God's triune nature and his love. God is love and his desires for us to receive love and give love in relationship. And through those relationships to him and to others, we can experience intimacy, we can experience bonding, closeness and fulfillment. Now, one of these ways was through sexual intimacy with a member of the complementary sex, man for woman and woman for man. God designed sex and he designed us. And what did he create in our programming pertaining to sex and relationships? We're gonna explore that this morning. So the first thing that we learn, which is a continuation from what Pastor Dwight shared, is that God designed us for intimacy through relationship. In fact, Pastor shared that sex was God's idea and it's for procreation as well as intimacy and joy. And when a man and woman connect to each other in a sexual way, it is one of the most intimate physical expressions of their total union. Sex isn't supposed to be about how I can be fully satisfied, how me, how I get everything I want. Instead, it's designed to function as part of the giving of my whole self in a specific relationship. And this total union is part of the blessing of intimacy within the boundaries of marriage. So the second thing is that God designed us for boundaries in relationship. Boundaries, right? Sound like a bad word? In Titus 2, verse 11 to 12, it says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Boundaries are provided by God for our good for safety and for fulfillment and sexual boundaries are no different because outside of these boundaries we get it backward intimacy in sex flows from relationship not the other way around outside of sex family we seek relationship and expect to find it through sex but guess what vaginas and penises do not form relationships they are part of our genital sexuality it is our spirits and our souls that need and establish relationships. But if we get sex, but no affirmation of our identity or our sense of belonging from that person that we're with, you might falsely assume that what is needed is more genital sexual expression with someone else. So, you continue to offer your sex as down payment for intimacy. You start to exchange your sex to 
end loneliness. You start using your sex as coinage for acquisition of an ideal mate. You start using your sex as proof of prowess. And this is both male and female prowess these days to show your worth as a potential mate. Your worth ends up being based on sex appeal, not godly identity. It reduces you to what you can do, not who God says you are. Man of God, woman of God, don't listen to the devaluing voices. You are who God says you are. Psalm 139 in verse 14 is a very, 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 very popular verse, you know, but sometimes we discount it. It says, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And it is not for your potential mate to believe it and honor you. It is for you to believe it and honor God. In 1 Corinthians, Pastor Dwight mentioned it to him, say, run from sexual sin. You remember that, 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 that um, example he used for him, have to run out of him, custom house, run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. When I allow my identity to be downgraded to sexuality, it is a sin against my body. When you justify lowering your standards, you're sinning against your body. When you compromise so that you're not seen as a prude or, or as an idiot or you're too high and mighty or you're behind the times, it is a sin against your own body. Because guess what? When we ignore God's absolutes or deny or rationalize them, this doesn't invalidate them and it doesn't invalidate the consequences of ignoring them. Because before you know it, you actually start to feel satisfied with that pass through relationship as an okay goal to aim towards. And as married people, you start to get satisfied with a marriage that that it's okay to give a hall pass to your spouse. Yes, I said hall pass. That is a thing, right? I, can't, I couldn't believe it. That's where you have mutually agreed permission to have an occasional side fling. The blood. This isn't true satisfaction. Breaking sexual boundaries always lead to pain suffering and deeper and deeper depravity in thinking in degradation of your body and debauchery in your activities you start get wild as a matter of fact it says in Romans 1 28 to 29 since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do the things that should never be done and their lives became full of every kind of wickedness. God designed us, family, for covenant relationship. That's number three. And centuries of breaking boundaries to get what we think we want from sex has opened doors to all forms of wickedness over countless generations. It's not just now. The repression of sex in earlier generations was actually an obsession with sex as well. And that has now been replaced with an open obsession with sex. The society is preoccupied with your sexuality. And one result of that is that more and more people expect too much of sexual intercourse. In fact, <laughs> I was reading and, and I was reading this, this um, quote from Planned Parenthood who said, that says, sex can help you create connection with another person. Now that is a lie. And sexual pleasure has lots of health benefits, whether you're with a partner or not. <laughs> because when you get an orgasm, your body gives you a natural high and you release endorphins. And those hormones block pain. Family here in the lie and make you feel good. Sexuality from this viewpoint is devoid of sustained love, commitment, 
And all it does is pair itself with seduction, conquest, erotic orgasmic behavior, obsession with sex. And it inevitably leads to dysfunctional attitudes and behaviors. Peer pressure is teaching our teenagers that they must score as often, as, that's what sex is, scoring as often as possible. Singles are ridiculed if they remain virgins. Performance is stressed and it causes a lot of interpersonal strain. So if you no longer wait until you experience social intimacy or spiritual compatibility or shared purpose, these sexual connections are temporary at best. And every time we get into it, you hope that the next time something going to come out of it or the next time something going to come out of it. But you perpetually fail. You perpetually become dissatisfied. That's no way to live. Sex rather than God becomes the center of our life and sexual release rather than relationship is a justified pursuit. It's okay for me to just be looking to get sex if, if, if you know, I feel the need for release, I just get into to something with somebody, a situation, a pass through, whatever. And even in marriage, the connection that started with sexual attraction alone and left little time to form more crucial bonds or those more crucial bonds were ignored before putting on the ring. Those connections suffer under the pressure of the intimacy vacuum. Look here, marriage is not colon cleanse of dysfunctional sexual expression. And going in front of the pastor doesn't sanitize a hollow covenant that had put God's will and boundaries on the back burner. The Bible teaches us that one can be overpowered and two can defend themselves, but a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And that's the same thing with every relationship and especially with marriage. But a marriage that doesn't have the preeminence of God, not as a figurehead, as that third strand, as a rough road. And I've seen too much pain too much separation, too much divorce in Christian relationships. Marriage is the mirror of Christ and the church. Amen. It is through marriage that we honor each other. It is through marriage that we honor God. We honor each other in our identities and we have that beautiful benefit of expressing love to the other through sex. But if the marriage started with a spouse being the target of our pursuit, it was just an objective outside of God's will to get an attractive spouse or to get power or to, to have financial safety or to have a baby. Then the covenant may not have been activated in your marriage and you struggle to find a footing. You know, a survey in the USA has actually said about divorce. John, it's the Barna Group. George Barna found that 33% of born-again adults. Now, he was very specific. It's not all of the church. These are the persons who have declared that they're born again. Um, charismatic churches, Protestant churches. 33% who have ever been married have been divorced. Covenant not activated. Covenant being undermined. All right, let me shift gears now. In Jamaican society, it declares without apology that I am entitled to sexual pleasure. And if it is denied, relationship with you is not worthy of pursuit. If you're not going to put off, it make no sense. If you're not going to put out, rather, it doesn't make no sense to go any further with you. It says that the cycle of sexual predominance and having genital sexual expression is a be-all and end-all of existence. And I know that in Christian relationships, in fact, I know that in this church, that a lot of singles are experiencing that kind of pressure from their potential mate. If they're not going to put out, then it don't make sense. Even when you have this genuine desire to have a pure relationship people are talking <laughs> people are talking about who naga tech 
pussy in a bag. Yeah. And them have to taste and buy in church. Blood. It's a diabolical standard That's right. that Christian singles today are up against. And the shaming culture reinforces it. This culture declares that the proper rules of relationship are all fashioned like courtship. You no, know, say, someone out there even, don't even know what that word is. Is what that? <laughs> So the initial engagement with a potential partner in a lot of relationships is based on sexting a body part to each other. <laughs> and situationships, which I've, met, I've mentioned before, means that even dating is outdated. Um, who here, who listening, who's joining online has ever heard, hey, hey, you know, let's not label this as yet. <laughs> you know? Let's see where this goes. <laughs> Situationships, short-term planning, inconsistent interaction, little to no emotional connection on one or both sides, no exclusivity, no interaction or knowledge of who one another, friend or families. In that kind of relationship, you're going to be unsure of your worth, you're going to be unsure of your identity, and then you start to find your value in your sexuality, in your body. And then all of a sudden you find yourself just being focused on your body, making sure you look good, making sure that when you come to church you look put together because you have to look good. It is important that I look good all the time. It is so important that I always look good. Every little, every little knot, every little bump, every little everything. Perfection, body surveillance. What is body surveillance? It's a constant monitoring of one's body and being preoccupied with how one's body appear. That preoccupation can actually look like it's a healthy thing, you know. You know, you've got gym, you lose weight, and da 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 da. And yes, but you're preoccupied. You're preoccupied with how you look. You're self conscious, you have impossible standards. Shame starts to creep in. Look, it's good to be healthy, you know. And it's good to have a healthy body image and it's good to have a healthy weight. But sometimes you find that, that those activities and, 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 and occupations and preoccupations actually come from an issue of worth and sexualization that actually needs to be healed that my identity needs to be healed. As a Christian, how can I be in a situation like that, hoping that it's going to change one day? One day when I've proven that I am worthy to be somebody's mate. One day when I have proven that I'm worthy to continue to be wife. I have to make sure that as a husband, I want, is what is, I want this a grow around you. <laughs> you just have to be proving yourself and proving yourself and proving yourself through sexualization, whether you're single or you're married. It can't continue. That kind of interaction is so exhausting. My interaction can't be open-ended and, and, and based on what I bring to the table. That's a lie from the devil. That's right. And when relationships are open-ended and disconnected and there's a performance-based atmosphere, even in marriage, those marriages usually remain that way until repentance before God is done and true covenant is activated that I covenantly choose to love this man. I covenantly choose to love this woman for who they are, for who God has made them. And that is the reason why we're together. Amen. Even outside of six, it can't be if him have a job or if him do have a job. If she start to lose her looks after she have the first baby. Huh? <laughs> eh? 
some things start go south and all of a sudden, mm, you're not who I married. What? Who you married is a child of God Amen. with a purpose in Christ. And you promise to be aligned with that purpose until death do you part. Right. Not until her breasts stay up. We have to do better. We have to do better. Our Heavenly Father, pastors, psychologists, statisticians, fashion magazines tell us that healthy relationships minimize pain, prevent brokenness, prevent never-ending cycles of failed personal interactions. But we not only have to believe it, family, and agree with it, we have to accept it and act on the basis of this fact. And as believers, healthy relationships are God-based relationships. And we move from brokenness to healthy by being healed by our Jehovah Rapha, our healer. He's not our accuser. He's not shaming us for past sins. Only the devil does that. When he asks us to face them and, and share about them and deal with them, it's not from condemnation. Only the devil does that. God is our lover. He's our maker. He is the one who gave us this beautiful identity. And when we discover it anew, when we turn back to him and away from sexual dysfunction, a discovery that we have is that our sexuality enriches us but does not define us. Amen. So family, how do I raise a bar? How do you raise a bar? I have three points. One, you raise the bar by embracing and walking in your godly identity. You have eternal life. You're safe from eternal judgment. And as you walk in submission and repentance before God, the weight of sin is lifted from your daily experience. So you have to really press into God and embrace your identity. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Family, you know it? Yes, man. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We know what the Bible says about our godly identity. We believe it, but we don't really embrace it. On a daily basis, we prove that we accept our heaven destiny. Yes, we know we're going to heaven. But we really sometimes want to continue to live our life on earth the way we please. And we want for God to be okay with it. But you see, this all things that have become new, this new godly identity comes with hard work. It's hard work to let go of the way that you used to do things. It's hard way to let go of conforming to societal standards. It's hard to accept that I will be different from my peers and even my family as I embrace a new way of life that may seem too tame or full of too much sacrifice. Am I talking to somebody? Does anything I have said seem familiar to your experience? And are you ready to invite God into your sexuality? He's ready, you know. He's waiting to help you change your mindset. All you have to do is offer your mindset to God. Right now. Offer your sexuality to God. He won't take it away. He'll just change it to what it needs to be. And where there has been trauma or disappointments, cynicism, persons who have hurt you and know there's unforgiveness in your heart, God is ready to forgive and heal. Just offer your repentance now to God. And let him soften your heart and surround you with his love 
and teach you who you are. And then you just watch him change your heart as you lean on him. All right, I'm going to talk now first about singles. Singles, I want to encourage you to raise the bar by embracing courtship and boundaries. One, situationships are off limits. Compromising to get the mate with a plan to clean it up afterwards is out. You come to church every Sunday, you go life group, you hear what everybody say, but day after day, week after week, month after month, maybe year after year, it's the person who is willing to compromise that gets the guy or gets the girl. And you're being pure and you're, lose, you're losing out. So you, know, you say, you know what? I don't want me to do. And then after me get married, me fix it up afterwards. No, 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 no. Too many of those persons are are in counseling right now. Engaging in sexual relationship as a precursor to consideration for marriage fails and cause long term suffering. As a matter of fact, even engaging in too romantic relationship as a precursor to consider marriage can also cause problems. What do I mean? The interest just sparks between the man and the woman, the Christian man and the woman. And then you're on weekends away together, beach trips in bikinis, sweet nothings to each other, sexual, sexual texting, sexual touching, making sure you don't have sex by making out, which is, which is all that has happened is that there has been no penetration, but everything else has occurred. And depending, it's French kissing, visiting apartments to have intimate dinners. What, 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 you're try, what you're trying to do? Find out if the lady can cook. What you're doing in our bedroom, waiting on her for cook dinner? Yeah, man, yard. <laughs> Pastor Dwight reminded us that Song of Songs is in the Bible, and it's a beautiful book that you should read. And it celebrates the beauty of marriage as a reflection of God's love for his people. But even as it does this in a wonderful way, there is a caution. You find it in, in, in Song of Songs 2.15 and it says you must guard the vineyard as you wait for marriage. Because it says the little foxes can damage the fragile blossoms of the vineyard. What are these little foxes? They're potential problems that can damage the relationship prior to the marriage. And there's one fox that's mentioned again, again, and again. It's mentioned in Song of Songs 2 verse 7. It's mentioned again in Song of Songs 3 verse 5. It's mentioned again in verse 8, in 8 verse 4. And it says, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. There are some activities that awaken love. There are some activities that arouse and it is dangerous to the fragile relationship during that courting phase before marriage. So what are the right steps that we should take when we desire to be married and and we want to interact with that potential mate. There's a difference between dating and courtship. Dating is where the daters keep the end of the relationship open-ended or unspoken. And say, let me see how it go. But if you have a dating mentality, then you partner up as soon as you have that surface interest and the danger is that exclusivity becomes too intimate too soon without a mutual understanding and respect of each other's end goal. And if, only, if it's only after a whole year of this exclusivity, you realize that, oh, I'm not socially compatible, spiritually compatible, I don't have a shared purpose 
and you just break up and move on to the next person. The intimacy is deep and then it is severed and it is so traumatic it leaves a trail of broken hearts and cynicism all across the church. Worse if you're trying to keep it under wraps because you don't want to appear to be a flirt in the church or you don't want to make it look too official. The under wraps motive actually works against you to isolate you and create intensely sexual situations. What did 1 Corinthians 6, 18 say? It said, run. run. Now, courtship has only one objective for both persons, engagement and marriage, full stop. Amen. I'm encouraging you to have a courtship mentality where you have exclusivity when you are ready for marriage. When you start engaging in social interactions with one person, when you desire marriage. And this end goal needs to be clear up front. Now round, round the corner thing. Don't be afraid of that conversation. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to talk about end goals. Because my end goal or one person's end goal may be different from the other person's end goal or have significantly different timelines. Both of you may have be ready for marriage, but then you say, wait, for me, it's in within one year. And for you, it's five to 10 years after I finish school. So if you have the conversation up front, then you can decide what do you want to do. Do you want to pursue this relationship? Are you willing to be strong and, and maintain healthy boundaries for the period of time that you have agreed? We're free in Christ, so you don't have to adopt this culture of, let's see if she says I love you first, or I'm going to have to go wait until him say it first, and then you play all kind of emotional games, and everybody's afraid, afraid to speak their mind. Speaking your mind is not about giving ultimatums, it's honesty. The other way only leads to manipulation and anxiety and lies and a, and a bag of game playing while you're, while you're, while you're, you're, you're trying to form and forge a relationship. Don't be afraid to talk about what it is that you are looking for. It's a okay, it's the acceptable, it's the right conversation to have before you start to engage in, in exclusive interactions with each other. And if the potential mate is actually, instead of being honest and open, is really actually being pressuring and giving your ultimate terms, then, then maybe it's not even worth it. That person may not be ready. And if you determine that you're only going to court, if you're going to have a courtship mentality, then your strategies to learn about the potential mate will be different. It will be based on God's leading through prayer. You alone, you and your prayer partner, you and someone who is more spiritually mature. Persons have come to me, persons have come to pastors and say, you know, um, I've seen this young man, I've seen this young lady, and, and I think I'm interested, from, from afar they look like somebody that I might be interested in. Can you pray with me to see if I should approach and ask, um, would you, are you in the same frame of reference? Sometimes they've done that and they've approached a person and made it very clear up front. Look, courtship works, you know. Right here in this century, right now. In this church. In this church. And they've gone to the person and said, I, 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 I'm interested, I'd like to court and the person has said well I'm not that's not where my head space is at no hard feelings everybody move on it's good it's healthy yeah. no game playing courtship is based on observation of character not observation of curves or observation of coinage 
courtships is based on seeking out alignment of spiritual destiny compatibility in your social interests in your family goals mental attraction yeah. Yeah. you actually like each other <laughs> Actually, if you like your wife or life, like your husband, you know, it's really very important. <laughs> and then your activities together are going to be activities that come to your mind that will allow that goal to be met. Instead of private dinners, take the lady to a nice restaurant where you can eat and talk and laugh and find out which boys charm school she like and how she treats others. How she treat the waiter. Yeah. Sit in church together. Deliberately interact with friends and family openly because you have an upfront understanding that you have an end goal in mind. You're trying to see if this person can be a partner for life. Yeah. See how he spends money. Mm-hmm. See what happens when I take longer than normal to get ready. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I know from, from, from just interaction with, with, with our brothers and sisters, with believers, that some of these things are the things that are actually making or breaking relationships right now. And then when you've gotten to know the person, start premarital counseling as early as possible. Not after you've sent out the, the save the date for your, yes. your engagement or your marriage, your wedding. And don't worry, you know, your spiritual leaders are going to be sure to talk about sex. I know about TLC. Here we, we have a very thorough. <clears throat> all, those, all those married couples who were, who were married here and have been counseled by Pastor Dwight, Pastor Joan, and the other pastors. <laughs> and some of our, our, our pre-counseling um, ministers right now, you know, it's three to six months. And it is intensive. And we're not afraid to ask the questions. The important questions. Sometimes it's longer than, than, than the six months. When we know that it may need more than the six months because we all have feet of clay. And some things may need to be worked out. It's not hopeless, you know, but some things may need to be worked out because everybody take off the mask in these counseling sessions. You don't come in here and, and play a game. And some of them are less than the three months because we have pastors and, and counseling ministers who don't play. They're hearing from the Lord. They're prophetic, and they know that this don't make sense. And it's better that your heart gets a little bit of wounding now than years of wounding down the road. Because pastors aren't afraid to tell you, we're not afraid to tell you that you guys are going down different roads. And we're not afraid to hang in there with you. Hang in there with you when we know that God wants this for you. And we'll talk about sex. Sex is very important. It's very much a part of that courtship conversation. So then if you're worried about, mm, am I going to be buying puss in a bag? Yes. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. But God is a good, good father and knows all your needs. Matthew 6 verse 8 says that, Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. It is good. It is good. It is beautiful when you wait. It is beautiful when you wait. Mm-hmm. Pastor Dwight in his last message shared about somebody who, 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 who reset. Mm-hmm. Watch it on YouTube if you weren't here last Sunday. It's beautiful when you wait. 
Now, married couples, I'm going to talk to you too. You're going to raise the bar by embracing and activating covenant. You know, today's world makes it so difficult for us to experience a sense of belonging in, in too many ways. But marriage shouldn't be one of them. That covenant structure is vital to help a relationship endure through periods when emotion is not a sufficient bond. Love alone, naga, make it. <laughs> it's important, but not the only thing. Covenant is what is established when you truthfully went before God to join, to become one. And now you need to embrace that covenant. Self-interest, convenience, momentary pleasure at the expense of long-term rewards. If that was the case, just, just repent of objectifying your spouse in these ways and renew your covenant before God to each other. God can redeem your marriage and bring healing. Lay it before him and watch him miraculously activate or restore a covenant blessing to your marriage. And if I'm speaking to you right now, do a spiritual cleanse of your marriage by presenting it to God. You know the truth, you know. It don't make sense to pretend. You're not wrestling against flesh and blood. You're not wrestling against the woman. You're not wrestling against the man. You're wrestling against a diabolical strategy to steal, kill, and destroy. To destroy you, to destroy him or her, to destroy your family, to destroy your children, to destroy everything in your life, to leave you on the ground as nothing. It is the covenant that needs to be restored before God and God is our healer. He heals our marriages. No matter how they started, he can heal them. He can heal them. He's a God of the impossible. If you think it's impossible, he can heal it. There are things that, that just need to be taken out of it. Ungodly soul ties, ungodly attitudes and thoughts and motives. It can be removed and cleansed. The Lord, the Lord took away all of your sin, you know. <laughs> took away all of my sin. It can't do anything. <sighs> Try again. Don't, don't give up. Try again, try a new way. And some of you who have joined us today in church, maybe you need to raise a bar by embracing salvation. We started this message, the series by saying that God loves us and, and wants to be in relationship with us to provide that intimacy, safety, and fulfillment. And we get that as well as fulfilling relationships when we accept Jesus and his free gift of life, true life, true satisfaction. John three sixteen to 17 says, for here is the way God loved the world. He gave his only unique son as a gift. So now everyone who believes in him will never perish, but experience everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to judge and condemn the world, to be its savior and to rescue it. Jesus came to rescue us from our failed attempts to find love and to restore us to true love, true intimacy, true satisfaction and that includes through salvation in him that's primary little thing and if you're ready to receive this this true love I invite you to pray with me now Lord I thank you that your love is sweeter than life that it gives true satisfaction I 
I give my repentance to you, Lord, and accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. I repent of all my sin and accept your free gift of eternal life today. I ask you to forgive me to come into my life as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for your salvation. Amen. And if you pray this prayer for the first time or, or if you're recommitting your life, I want to congratulate you. And you can navigate to your connection card um, in the description to this video and check the box that I want to be saved. And then you know you, you immediately move to your, the next wonderful step of obedience, which is baptism. And you can find out more about that as well. For believers in Jesus, it's not too late to seek after God's heart. And in doing so, finding all the love that you need. In him, as well as in the relationships that he has lovingly prepared for you. In community, in family, and sometimes in marriage. But are you willing to trust God's design? Are you willing to trust his boundaries, his choices, his plan for your life? I know how difficult it is to release, you know, to let go of your search for full fulfillment and give it to God, but it's worth it. I encourage you to repent to seek God's direction through prayer and the word, to, to practice submission to God and his directions daily, to make lifestyle changes, to move out of the house, change your living situation, to let go of, of toxic relationships, to allow the community of believers to, to support you in, in what I know can be a very painful, very painful experience. I want to encourage you that you can't do this alone. You can't, you can't keep your business to yourself. It, it doesn't, it never works. It never works. It never works. Share, share with a pastor. Be willing to get professional help. Because sometimes that's needed. These, these circumstances can be so traumatic. Be prepared to go the long haul, allowing God to be the foundation of your restoration. I want to pray for you. I feel like a lot of people are and as praying about this message, I felt like a lot of people are um, like sleepwalking through their life because the pain is too great and they, don't, they either don't know the right way, another way, how else to do it. They, they, they tried it and it never worked and you just, just let go and you're just sleepwalking. All right, and I want to say in the name of Jesus, I want you to snap awake. I have a person here in service today to snap awake in the name of Jesus. Come awake to the circumstances, the decisions that are outside of God's law. Beyond God's boundaries, snap awake now in the name of Jesus. In your marriages, the unwholesome thoughts, the, 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 the frustrations, the, the, the feeling that there is no solution, snap awake now in the name of Jesus to the lack of covenant. Snap awake now to covenants that have been solid and need to just be cleansed. Snap awake now to God's holy command. Snap awake now to his refining, in his refining power. Snap awake now to the need for purity. Snap awake. 
Don't let Monday just turn into Tuesday, turn into Wednesday, and you're doing the same thing. Snap awake in the name of Jesus. Allow the Holy Spirit to burn a fire in you once again right now. Right now. Burn away everything. Refine us fire. Burn away everything that is not of God. That is in our relationships and in our relationship mindset. In the name of Jesus. Being aware of our sinfulness is not condemnation. It is a step to God's beautiful washing and cleansing. His healing, his restoration. True life awaits you when you wake up. and are strengthened by God. And as you turn to God, to do in your sex what God wants you to do, then you'll see healing When your sexuality is in your, your beauty, isn't based on, on, on your sexuality and an obsession with sexuality, what God can do. And I want to pray for those marriages. I want to pray for some marriages now that are sexless. Women who haven't seen their, their husband in a bed in months. Because covenant has been broken. In some of those situations, unlimited hall pass because you know say he or she is going somewhere else to, to fulfill that, that that which should only be fulfilled on the marriage bed. God, we declare that, that those evil deeds be broken now in the name of Jesus. We burn at the root everything that defiles covenant in marriage in the name of Jesus. We cut it off from, from every person struggling in their marriage in this way. In the name of Jesus and we apply the blood of Jesus to those marriages now. I invite persons who are using their sex to manipulate their spouse to repent now in the name of Jesus. You're in the marriage and your body belongs to your spouse. But you pick and choose whether or not they get it if they, if they do this action or they refrain from that action. Those are diabolical things. I'm not talking about abusive situations and dangerous situations where it's actually dangerous to have sex because of what you know your spouse may be doing. I'm talking about manipulation for your own objectives. We rebuke those things now in the name of Jesus. We cut off the use of sexuality and, 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 and holding hostage sex in marriage in the name of Jesus. We ask you, God, to forgive us 
as believers, Lord, in this church, in, 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 in the body of Christ, of, of these behaviors that are offense to you and offense to you, an offense to the covenant that we established with you and with our spouses. Cleanse us, God. Wash us, Lord. Lord, we invite your holy presence, Lord, into our relationships, God. We invite your refining and purifying presence into our relationship mindset for those of us who are not yet married. Cleanse our minds, God. As a people of God, And as we submit our thoughts, our bodies, our marriages, our plans to you, we declare with joy that we receive your godly identity. We declare that we are defined by godly identity. We declare that our relationships are a product of our godly heritage. And we declare in the name of Jesus and by his power and by his grace that we are guided by our godly destiny. In love relationships. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. I know that some work was being done. Some strongholds were being broken. And even as I leave, I pray just a blessing on each and every one of you. And that change an activation of covenant will come. And in a moment, you will hear more about the different ways that you can get support in your new journey. Amen. God bless you.